Hello, everyone. I'm Victor Cuadrado, and I'm here today to talk about how to enforce a supply chain no, on Kubernetes. This, this talk was an original submission by a colleague and I, uh, by Raul Cabello and I, for, uh, for Victor, for the... Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's snap out of it. For KubeCon. Uh, who am I? Yeah, I was thinking about the next slide. Who am I? I'm Victor Cuadrado. I work right now uh, in SUSE as an open source software developer. I will, I'm going to keep it short. Uh, if you want to contact me, I don't have Twitter, but you can con contact me in the Matrix Network, so you have there my handle, and you have my, my personal page. Okay, so what's, what's a supply chain? I suppose everybody knows about that. Everybody has maybe seen this slide already today uh, and the last and the previous day and so on, which is super nice, and it's what should happen. This is a supply chain. For us, the package in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the cluster is going to be a container or a Helm chart. So for obtaining the container, we need to build it. And for building it, we need the source code. So here we have the chain. Also, the container is going to have dependencies. It's going to have container layers. It's going to have uh, libraries and so on. So for those uh, dependencies, we need also a place to build it. And we need the source code. And why do we want to secure the supply chain? Maybe, maybe yeah. <laughs> Maybe you guys have heard, you, you folks have heard of this week uh, attack on Rust, uh, on the Rust supply chain. There was an attack with a type squatter uh, attack with a package. They, they just pushed a package that had a similar name, similar name of, a, of another crate and tried, they tried to get into, into people's uh, chain that way. Or maybe you have heard about the, the PHP upstream uh, problem that happened uh, a bit ago, where they just uh, compromised their, their Forge, their source forge, and injected to uh, malicious commits in their, in their source. Or maybe you have heard about the SolarWinds IT, uh, IT management software, which they just they compromised the build the, their build service and injected a malicious uh, binary there that was injecting malicious things on every and each build. Or maybe you have heard about the, the code, cop, code cop product, where they just got a, a hold of some uh, credentials for their bucket and substituted the, the end uh, package right before the consumer. So yeah, you get the, the point, no? So how do you secure that? OK, you need provenance. You need signatures. You need software build materials. You need to know from where things are coming, and you need to trust where, where they are they coming from. You need transparency logs just to be able to check publicly that that's veritable and trustworthy. You need also to scan continuously for vulnerabilities. And you need to save the metadata somewhere in a database. Maybe it's going to be in Toto and so on. And then you need to check regularly for those results. And you need to do all of that following best practices. You cannot just maybe do it alone. It's going to be difficult, and maybe you're going to miss things. So talking about this best practices, you can implement this no? in, in several ways. One way of implementing it is with Sigstore. What is Sigstore? Well, Sigstore provides some specification and some workflow. Uh, this is a vendor neutral effort from the Linux Foundation. And it's really nice because it provides an automatable workflow. It can be just put on CI, which is what we want. No? I mean, for sure, all of you have, or a majority of you have uh, dabbled with GPT. I needed to create the public keys and the revocation certificates. Maybe you have, I don't know, Yubi keys with sub keys and so on. Yeah, I've been there. It's super nice. What happens about the web of trust? Yeah, the web of trust, it's kind of broken since five, seven years because it's been attacked fully. You just do it on your own. You just go around looking at people's keys and, and IDs and let's be honest, no. <laughs> I love GBG, but no, no. So instead of that, we can do it in a different way. We can shift a bit of the trust, and we can use an automatic key management uh, workflow. Uh, Sixtor calls it uh, keyless. We will see how it works. It uses basically uh, some PKI infra to set, it, to set everything out, and then a, a transparency log. And for us, this is great, Sixtor, because it supports container images, supports, container, uh, supports binaries, and also supports OCI artifacts. Uh, wasn't modules, wasn't binaries, which you will understand why is it important later, and Helm charts. And yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to uh, convince you in one um, talk of, of that this is trustworthy. I don't intend to do that, but you don't need to trust me alone. You can see, for example, Kubernetes, since version 124, it's signing everything with Sigstore, all the images and so on, and it will keep signing them onwards, which is super great. Let's see. 
Um, let's start with signing and then we go to verifying and you get an idea of, of the keyless mode, which is the nice mode of, of Zigstor. How do you sign in keyless mode? Here is one command. You can see cosine, sign, and then the image. That's it. What happens here? First, you need identity information of the developer. I'm the developer and I want to sign this. You need the identity information and you need the context of the, of the, of the signing. On which build uh, platform was it built? How and so on. For the, identity, for the identity, we just delegate that to an OIDC service, so an OpenID Connect, Open ID Connect service provider. And that's what's happening here. You get a URL, you go to the URL. This is predefined by the tool, it, and it shows you three providers of OIDC. You, of course, can just pass whatever URL and use your, um, your own Okta, for example, or Ypsilon, your own organization. Uh, OIDC provider. You don't need to use any of these. Once you uh, authenticate, then you are authenticated. Sixtor knows about it. And what happens here? Well, Sixtor creates a short lived cert that you would use just for signing, and then it would get discarded. You would normally use it only once. The, this uh, certificate comes from the Sixtor PKI as a certificate authority, authority. so it comes uh, signed with the, the Sixtor's uh, uh, root cert, and Sixtor also publishes the public key of that certificate into the transparency log. So then everybody could just check that that has happened in that specific moment, and the signature has happened in the specific window where it could be used, because it's a short-lived cert. And then you just sign with it and dispose of it. I understand that this is a bit convoluted, but it, it's, uh, it's quite nice. If you want to uh, learn more about uh, this, I have more slides, and maybe we can just uh, stop after the talk, and then we can go through it. So you sign. What happens when you sign? We are talking about container images. An image tag is it's just created and pushed to whatever uh, registry. In this case, I'm using GitHub, maybe because everybody knows about GitHub. And what is a signature? Well, it's just a new image tag. You can see it there, the first one, and the tag is the image digest, the checksum of what you are uh, signing. That's it, nothing more. Maybe you, you, one can understand that already. And how, how do we verify? Well, instead of doing cosine sign, we do cosine verify. In, that, in, that, in, this, in this process, we have an artifact. From the artifact, we get the checksum. From the checksum, we find the signature on our registry. Once we get that, then we can go through what happens here, which is basically, we check the signature uh, cryptographically, cryptographically, just to see that it has been signed by the public key that matches and so on. We check the, the chain of, of certificates from the, the root CA of, of Sixtor. Then we can go to the transparency log and check that the public key was uh, issued in that specific time frame where you, can, you, you could use it. And then after that, of course, we would need to check ourselves, the ID and the context. I mean, we have we have uh, checked that there was a signature, but then it needs to be signed by the specific person that we trust. No, I mean, that makes sense. So yeah, it's a bit convoluted, but let's see how do we shift the trust. How do we trust Caseless? Well, we need to trust the developer's identity. Normally, that's a list of emails or something like that, a list of handles in their source for. Normally, it's embedded in the source code or it's embedded in a file in, in the source code and so on. And we need to trust the infra, the, 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 the Code Forge and their builders and so on, which we always need to trust. Now we have the OIDC provider that we are delegating a bit of information normally, but that could come also from the organization of the developers, so you are keep you keep trust in the same group of people, and then you trust the PKI, the PKI infra and the transparency log, which you can also roll your own, and you expect big organizations to also roll their own. Why not? And Let's, in contrast with uh, GPG, for example, where we would just check the public keys in the web of trust, um, check that the things were signed with the correct private key, then check that there was no revocation certificates somehow at some point. Now we just have the signature and then the public key and the chain of, of certs and so on at the and the timestamp on the transparency log. Okay, this is perfect. Now we know how to sign and verify, but we need to do this automated because we want to do it. How do we do it in CI? If you remember, it was all automated. The only thing was the OIDC token. Well, it's a CI. We just use an OIDC token inside of CI. What's the state of the art right now? Um, 
CIs that support IDC tokens are uh, GitHub, as I know, as I, as I know so far, GitHub, Circle CI, and Google Cloud products. With uh, GitLab, we would need to, uh, it's still missing uh, generic IDC tokens because a token, it's a JWT token, needs to have the uh, audience set to Sixtor, so it can only be used with this. And it's also missing some tooling on the Sixtor side, on, the, on all the utilities, but it will come. Also, uh, you can use a service account token volume projection, which is new since Kubernetes 120, which is quite old, actually. That, what that means is that you just put the token on the node, and with this, Kubernetes would expose it on the pods. And inside of the pods, you can uh, reuse it in, in, in uh, I don't know, Tecton, for example. Okay, a specific, a specific example. This is a, a GitHub CI workflow. It would be, as usual, you just build and push your image. The last four lines are the new thing. Basically, getting the cosine CLI and doing a cosine sign. Done. You're done. That was easy. How do you verify that? You do the same as you would do before, uh, cosine verify. The only thing that has changed is the things that uh, are set on the signature and come from the cert, which is the issuer, in this, guy, in this case, token actions it have user content, which tells you that it was signed inside of the CI, and the subject, which is the context. If you look at the subject, you see it's github.com, bitquad, app example, and then the file name and the, and the path. You can match for that subject. If you match for the whole thing, you would only accept that specific signature. If you match, but you stop in bitquad app example, then you, you would trust everything that comes from that specific repo, even if it's another workflow. And if you stop when, in BigQuad, for example, then you would trust everything that comes from me. That's, that's the, the gist of it. Of course, you need to follow best practices. If you were to just match on your own, and somebody creates another, another user that is called BigQuad2, if your regex or your matching is not good, then you could match it also. So, you know, these things, there's little gotchas everywhere and that you need to follow with best practices and you need to delegate at some point because it's a lot of things to think about. Okay. We know how to sign and verify. We know how to sign and verify in CI. We need to enforce it in the cluster. For doing that, we can use... Um, a thing in Kubernetes, which is a dynamic ambition control, uh, dynamic ambition control, maybe you all uh, already know about it. Uh, a gist of it basically is you have a pod. You can see here on the left, we have the, our happy user and then a bit of automation hitting the API server, which is the blue uh, box in the middle, and then the ADCD on the other side, which would, uh, where things would uh, end up, no? Let's say that the user wants to inst instantiate a pod and we want to modify that pod and add an annotation to that pod. Well, the, the user uh, sends a JSON request, it gets authenticated and authorized, then it goes to the mutated admission, and we have some webhooks that we can plug. By plugging those webhooks, we change the JSON request in the JSON, we just add annotation, prod, that's it. Then goes to schema validation, where it gets checked, so the JSON keeps being conformant and it's a, a, a Kubernetes object, and then it gets validated. Maybe we only want to validate if the annotation equals to prod and not uh, test. We can do that also there. And then it, gets, it goes to ATCD and the pod goes live. We need a specific example. In this specific example, I'm going to use Kubewarden because, to be honest, it's the project that I'm working on with my colleagues, so I know it by heart, and it also has some niceties. Uh, Qwarden, of course, is open source um, from SUSE, but we welcome. It's completely open and, and not under, under any um, organization in, in GitHub uh, related to SUSE, so we intend to give it back to, to the community. What is Qwarden? Well, it's a policy engine. Of course, it monitors and enforces policies, depending on how you uh, specify them. And it comes with Helm charts, you know, you install it with Helm charts, it defines three CRDs, you just define the policies on the CRDs, and so on. In, in this case, it's written, the, the, the server and, and the, li the libraries are written in Rust. So for Sixtor, we will need to use the Sixtor crate. Uh, Sixtor didn't have any uh, Rust crate. We needed to implement it, it, implement it from the ground up. 
and it's there uh, in Sixth upstream. If you are a Rust uh, developer and would like to contribute, please feel feel free to use the the crate. We have uh, several uh, com uh, com companies and, and people contributing to it, so it's great to to see that support on Sixth and Rust. And Qwarden has uh, a nice thing, which is that all policies are WASM modules. So you can a WASM module is a WASM binary. You can run them. Compile from Rust, Go, Swift, TypeScript, Rigo. You have your policies on Rigo, on OPA, or uh, Kyberno, and so on. You just compile them to Wasm and you run them. Why WebAssembly is so nice? Well, uh, it's small, it's polyglot, it's secure, it's portable. WebAssembly is just um, a binary instruction format. It's a common architecture that you can just compile your programs to. And it's a sandbox runtime uh, VM, and it's Completely secure in that sense. It's way more secure than other things. I'm not going to get uh, much in, into that, but it's it's nice. For us, it means that we can just keep using your 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 preferred language. You don't need to learn a common, uh, you know, like a, a domain specific language. You just use whatever language you want to to create your policy that it's uh, supported by Wasm, and then you just use Git and and you use your libraries of the language and you get done with it. And then it's distributed by, by OCR registries because Wasm modules, Wasm binaries, are first, have first class support on, on OCR registries, so you don't need to do anything. And the policies can be executed outside of, of Kubernetes. You can just run your binary outside and check that it's doing what, what it's supposed to do. Okay, with a specific example, how do you sign and verify a, verify a policy in CI? With, the, with our case, we would just do the same and check the subject. And in the, in the case of QWarden, you can ensure it also locally with a little tool that we call KWCTL, which can do it outside of the cluster, or you can just run the policy outside of the cluster. For all the policies of QWarden, we have a hub where you can just submit your, your personal ones. Signed policies are marked as such in the hub, so that's nice. And now we have our policy. It has been signed. It was signed as a container image. You didn't need to do anything special nor learn about it. Now you want to ensure that all your policies in the cluster are trusted. You just configure QWarden to check those. To get a default config, you can just do a KWCDL and get your default config. For example, this one that would validate and trust all the QWarden policies. And maybe the next step now, you have the policies uh, trusted. You want to trust everything inside of your cluster, all the container images. How do you do that? Well, we have a policy uh, written in Rust. You could just write your own if you wanted. This policy checks all the containers in a pod, all the container images, all the init containers, all the ephemeral containers, so you are sure that all the containers are checked. How does it do? It's just a policy. Gets a JSON request for the pod, and then goes to the, all the container images. Are the container images signed? Yes. Are they signed by the person that you want it to be signed? Yes or no? If no, it rejects them. If yes, you can approve them. But ah, yeah, you have container images, the tags, the tags are mutable. You can pu push a container image 1.0, and next week you push again 1.0. Mm, that, that could be an attack vector. So the best practice is to mutate the, the, the definition of the pod. And you mutate it by adding whoop, we will see it later, how we would mutate it. How do we instantiate that policy? In QWarden, you just create a cluster emission policy. You can see it there, nothing special. Spec on module for those in the back, it's just the policy. The rules, it's just for pods, create an update, and then mutating true, and then some settings for the policy. In this case, I'm putting image all. I want to check all the images. All the images need to be signed by this specific workflow. You could just the subject, you could just put an asterisk and only check until you want, and we will make sure that it's uh, sanitized and so on, and it will get checked. Then we, will, we, we just wait for the cluster emission policy to be active, and it's enforcing. And now if we try to instantiate a pod with untrusted images, let's say Nginx, which we know that it's not trusted by us, I mean not signed by us, we try, and what happens? Verification of image failed, no signature found in this case. If we try to instantiate something that is trusted, we, we just launch the pod and it mutates. There, in the, in the end, we get uh, cube control get pod of the image, and the image has the tag and the digest at the end. So we mutate it so nobody can substitute that, that tag in the future. 
So what's next? There's a lot of things to secure a, a cluster. One, one part is the software bill of materials. We have talked about our container images, our policies, and so on, but we need to do it recursively now for all the dependencies that we have. Talking about uh, software bill of materials, it's a complex topic and it's a big one. I think it deserves its own uh, talk, to be honest. The, the way to do it would be, for example, using Intoto for the specification of the metadata, and then you would use uh, Cosine and the six -door utilities and six -door libraries because they have support for that. And then, this is a community effort. We all depend on something, no? So please sign and verify anything and everything. Maybe you don't use uh, Sixtor, maybe you want to use something else, but please sign and verify. And at some point, we're going to have the whole stack signed and verified, and it's going to be great. And I would be happy if, if that happens. And I would be happy if that's what you get out uh, of the talk with. And then, about other KubeCon talks, uh, I have some colleagues going to KubeCon. One that really I really like about Wasm and, and, and so on is what if the Cube API server could be extended with WebAssembly? You have seen Cube Warden, you have seen the, um, the policies written in Wasm. Now imagine that it's all inside of the API server. I don't want to spoil it, but it would simplify a lot of things. And then also from my colleague Rafa, I have, we have also Q, uh, Kubernetes is your, is your platform design patterns for extensible controllers, which is, has a lot of learns and know-how on how to design a nice controller from Rafa, uh, from Rafa and Fabrizio, also from SUSE and VMware, and that's it. How do we how to get involved? Please come, come to us. If you want to talk about Qwarden, here's the website, here's the policy hub, here's our GitHub, and so on. If you want to talk uh, with me, then you have there my matrix uh, handle, and that's it. Many thanks. <laughs>